In the R8 V10 sees Audi taking on the cream of the world's sports car elite, and every one of them must take this car very seriously indeed. Not long ago, the thought of paying six figures for an Audi, any Audi, would have seemed absurd. It's a mark of the excellence of this R8 V10 that at the wheel, it feels perfectly logical. Logical? When that kind of money would buy you a Porsche 911 Turbo, or if you're more Sloan Square than Silverstone, uh, an Aston Martin DB9, a, a Maserati GTS, or a Mercedes SL63 AMG. Well, look at the facts. The R8 has a better power to weight ratio than the Porsche. It looks more arresting. And if you want exotic, well, there's a Lamborghini engine here, right where it should be behind the seats. As for any of the other cars I mentioned, well, they wouldn't see which way this car went on a track or a twisting road. This is Audi shaking the establishment. Let's find out how they've done it. All the ingredients are here for a world-beating supercar. Relatively light weight, an agile chassis, and a glorious engine. But where Porsche has had um, nearly 40 years to put these together in world-beating perfection, Audi had had less than four by the time this 10-cylinder R8 was launched in 2009. No matter, it's still brilliant. What it isn't is the kind of completely different proposition that a 911 Turbo is when you compare it to a standard Porsche 911. This is simply a more complete and faster R8. But there's certainly nothing wrong with that. You'll be wanting the statistics. Resta 60 takes just 3.9 seconds on the way to a top speed of 196 miles an hour. Now that's just 0.7 seconds quicker than the already very rapid 420 brake horsepower V8 version. But on the move, the almost endless reserves of torque make the difference feel far greater than that. Yes, the thunderous 518 brake horsepower 5.2 litre Lamborghini V10 does develop around 35 brake horsepower less than it does in a Gallardo Superlegro. But if you own this car, I can't imagine that you'd miss it. For the few that would, Audi did a limited run R8 GT that matched the Lambo's output exactly. The handlings are stage removed from the V8 variant too, thanks to springs that are 20% stiffer at the front, 22% stiffer at the rear, plus a thicker anti-roll bar. It also helps that this variant gets Audi's clever magneto rheological damping as standard, offering a choice of normal and sport settings via this button near the gear stick. Now, I've been driving this car at uh, the Ascari race circuit in southern Spain, one of the world's toughest tracks, and it's been a delight. Throw it into a corner and it works with you, with perfect driver feedback, no nasty habits, and a lovely uh, hard-edged whale as you thrust towards the 8,000 RPM red line, the horizon rushing towards you as if on fast forward. Like all R8s, this one is so beautifully driver orientated, courtesy of Audi's decision to give its Quattro four-wheel drive system a rear-wheel drive bias. No more than 35% of the torque ever goes to the front. What you won't find on this car is the kind of clever twin-clutch semi-automatic high-tech gearbox you'll uh, pick up on a rival Porsche. Instead, the automatic option for R8 customers is a somewhat clunky Lamborghini-derived R-tronic paddle shift semi-automatic system that really isn't the slickest of its kind. Fortunately, the six-speed manual gearbox that most R8 customers choose is lovely, slotting beautifully around its chromed Ferrari-style gate. Visually, the R8 is a distinctive cocktail of low-slung curves and delightful design extravagance. Ferrari, but with a German twist. But it won't appeal if you like the understated elegance of a Porsche 911 or the max power aggression of a Nissan GTR. But unlike those two rivals, it looks like a 100,000 pound supercar should. There are so many details to take in. The uh, side blades, for example, which channel air to the engine can be specified in many different colors and finishes. Even the lighting is suitably exclusive. This was the first production car to feature holy LED lamps front and rear. And the changes over the V8 model? 
Well, there aren't many, assuming that you haven't spotted the enormous V10 engine under the rear transparent cover or the badge work on the wings, visual tweaks are limited to the intricate 10 spoke 19 inch wheels, the wider sills, the enlarged air intakes and the different exhausts. Like all R8s, this one is impressively light, uh, just 60 kilograms more than the V8 variant thanks to the fact that 92% of its body and chassis is fashioned from pure aluminium. Go for the soft top spider variant though, and there's another 100 kilograms to carry around, the inevitable result of fitting it with a beautifully engineered hood that's coupe-like when raised and stows in just 19 seconds at speeds of up to 30 miles an hour. Inside, the interior remains an object lesson in how to package a two-seater car with plenty of space, decent visibility and fantastic Audi build quality. A pity though that the sat-nav information screen is uh, one of Audi's older offerings rather than the MMI touch system that the brand offers on far cheaper but more recently designed models. And luggage space? Well, your expectations won't be high and they shouldn't be. There's 100 litres of room in the front boot, enough for a couple of squashy bags, and there's a shelf behind the seats. But otherwise, you're gonna to need to be traveling pretty light. The list pricing makes it very clear which car Audi sees as this model's closest competitor. The 104,000 uh, pound asking price being pretty close to that of Porsche's 911 Turbo. You'll need a premium of around £9,000 on top of that if you want the pretty R8 Spider model with its beautiful soft top, or a premium of around £5,000 if you want the R-Tronic semi-automatic transmission instead of the standard six-speed manual box. As for competition, well, you could save yourself around £45,000 and buy a Nissan GTR, but it isn't quite the classy statement that many will want to make. A similarly priced Mercedes SL63 AMG isn't even in the same driver's league and neither, frankly, is the Aston Martin DB9 that would only cost you a little more. As for Italian Exotica, well, you could spend another £50,000 on a Lamborghini Gallardo Superleggero with basically the same engine and go not much faster. And uh, £65,000 more on a Ferrari 458 Italia that isn't much quicker either and has only two driven wheels. At first glance, the price premium of well over £20,000 that the R8 V10 demands over the V8 variant seems hard to stomach for a car that's less than a second quicker to 60. But that's before you read the fine print. Once you factor in the Nappa leather, the sat nav, the fancy side panels, the LED lights, and the magnetic ride that most R8 buyers want, there's less than £10,000 in it, which seems a fair premium for a fairly awesome car. No supercar is going to be cheap to run. This one certainly isn't. Um, in theory, you could average over 25 miles to the gallon if you're cruising gently, but throw in some hard driving spells and the figure will plummet well past the official 19.2 miles to the gallon combined fuel figure to make 15 miles to the gallon a realistic journey average. CO2 returns uh, will expect 351 grams per kilometre and uh, insurance is the top of the shop group 20. Depreciation is a much tougher thing to get a handle on and much will depend on how quickly these cars are built at the German Neckersund factory. Figures of 350 to 400 cars a year for the UK should ensure that R8s are never the over-familiar sight on our roads that say a 911 is, and that should help prop up residuals. Most R8 customers now buy a V10, and you can see why. The 518 brake horsepower feels about right for this perfectly balanced chassis. Gives you some idea as to just how good it was in the first place. Unlike its Italian rivals, it feels bulletproof. Unlike its Porsche arch enemy, it makes a six-figure statement. And unlike any sporting Audi yet produced, it's good enough to score a perfect 10.